Hey everyone, it's Classic DM, and tonight we're going to do something a little different like we usually talk about. Um, I've seen a lot of people lately, a lot of new people playing for 5th uh, edition, a lot of people who are getting into 1st edition, a lot of young people um, asking kind of a basic question. And the question is always like, hey, are there really cool adventures out there for uh, just two players, like a dungeon master and another player? Like, so if someone wants to play the game, they don't have a huge group. They, you know, they want to have a huge epic battles. They want to have a lot of fun, but they don't they only have like one person to play with. So if there any, a lot of times the first reaction is to say, go to the Facebook groups and say, hey, uh, is there a, a module designed for just one player? And you'll get a lot of answers. You get people say, oh, yeah, there's this one module done one time. It's really designed for, uh, you know, it's like keep on the borderlands. It's really designed for you just to play by yourself or with one friend. Or someone say, oh, in the old Dungeon Master's Guide, they got a, uh, you know, um, a random dungeon generator and, those answers are kind of like too literally, uh, in my opinion, nothing wrong with the answers, too literally trying to put a nut on the end of a bolt. And the thing is, if a little bit of design work, a little bit of creativity, and draw a lot of cool inspiration from a lot of really neat sources that are already there all over the place, you don't need to change much of anything. And so this episode is going to talk about what do you do? Well, what's the approach? How do you get this going? Because you want to play with your friend, uh, maybe you just got one friend, and there's a way you can do it, and it kind of requires a little thinking like a game designer. Now, I'm a video game designer, and when we're designing video games, we have to constantly pretend we're the player. Uh, power gamers, explorer players, completionist players, players that play with their partner or spouse or their roommate or their brother or their little brother or their little sister or with their dad or anything on console, PC. We have to think about all these millions of people that we never get to meet and how they're going to digest and enjoy playing the game. So we try our best to make sure that the game's going to give something for them. There's something in there for them to get into whether it's achievements or power curve or multiplayer, or whatever. You know, you play video games, you know what that's all about. This is the same, really the same thing in D&D. You're, a lot of people play D&D and love playing it, and but there's not, I would venture to say, that the approach to being a DM is not the same approach as being a game designer. So what I want to share with you is just my perspective, my thoughts on that, how to kind of infuse a little bit of game design into your campaign, especially to answer this one question where, hey, I want to play something two-player or just one friend playing. So let's just take a look. This is a board. This is a map we did a long time ago, and it's just a little jungle map. We've got some cool jungle sounds happening in the background from uh, Sword Coast Soundscapes, which I encourage you to go check out. I love his ambient tracks. They're wonderful. You know, and this is what you always visualize. You know, this massive battle scene where your party is wiping out all these bugbears and orcs, and you're at some cool temple, and you're on the beach or whatever, or whatever your vision is, whether you're in the desert, some oasis, murdering a bunch of thieves, or you're deep in the bowels of some castle dungeon, you're killing a lich, whatever it is. And D&D, Pathfinder, all the different editions of these games, even the new games coming out, they all have so much incredible content to pull from. And, you know, don't be intimidated to go back to something classic. Like I said in my introduction to first edition D&D, you can get a lot of the old, 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 simple, classic content as PDF format legally. You know, they've reprinted it and um, grab one of these old ones. You know, you don't need to go out and buy a $50 hardbound book that's really designed to be an adventure for, you know, five to six players, level seven to 16. There's nothing wrong with that. You can take something that when the old days was done for even more players and even more player population and just modify it. And... So let's get into some details. Let's talk about that more specifically. So the first thing I'd encourage you to do is talk to your friend. So say, hey, man, that's cool. Why don't, why don't I kind of wrangle something together for you? And uh, but I want to talk about it from two perspectives. So the first thing you want to ask your friend is, do you want to play for a particular character you already have? Like you've got this character you played in the Village of Hamlet or the Steading of the Hill Giant Chief, like our other show, or you've been playing in some homebrew campaign that a buddy did and he moved away, went to college, whatever. Some people have a favorite character. Like I've had my favorite characters over the year. So do they have a favorite character? They want to play something with that favorite character. And if that's the answer, then you're going to want to custom tailor everything to work around the theme of that character, what that character can and can't do, and also you're going to want that to appease the player. So you've got two clients there, really. You've got the you've got the player, and then you've got the actual character, too. So now the other way to approach it is someone said, well, you know, I kind of want to play a barbarian. Or I want to try playing a bard. I, do you, I haven't really played a bard before. It'd be kind of fun. Maybe we could play an adventure that, is there one out there we can buy that we can get that's just for a bard? Or if I want to play a rogue thing, I want to sneak around in shadows, disarm traps, and steal stuff. And when you look through all the commercially available stuff, there's not going to be 
a lot out there for you to work with. And you're going to have some obscure references to stuff from Facebook pages, which are great, but you have a tough time to get your hands on it. And I've never seen like a great commercial module made that says designed for one player and one DM. I really have never seen it ever. It doesn't mean they don't exist. Okay, because a lot more people play more hardcore games than I have, play Exalted and stuff like that. I never really got into those, but there could be, but not that I'm aware of. But you don't need that. What you can do is you can take anything and you can modify it. And if you think about it, um, what you got when you look at these other uh, commercially available modules and contents and books, and the inspiration can come from anything, okay? You just need to modify it so it work for your friend's character, if you got a regular Go character, or a pre-generated character he wants to play that you can give him. It doesn't have to be first level. You'll need to roll up some level one character. In fact, I encourage you not to do that. I encourage you to start with a character level five, six, or seven. It depends which edition. If you're playing first edition, I say four, five, six, and seven. If you're playing fifth edition, I'm not sure what the power curve is on that. If you're playing Pathfinder at 3.5, you know, start with level six, seven, and eight. Um, if they just want to try a class, you know, give them a chance to create a character that's a... Uh, um <laughs> Create a character that's uh, a few levels. I mean, starting a level one campaign, yes, it can be good if you're a really good player. If you really, 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 you're a Splinter Cell player, you're really great at playing that. You can play a four hit hit point thief <laughs> through the you know the keep on the borderlands or the village of Hamlet. You know, it's gonna be really hard, really methodical. There won't be a lot of action. You could probably get killed. I mean, it's like dying in character creation and traveler. I really kind of dissuade you from doing it. You want something that's heroic and epic, like in watching a movie or reading a book. So that's why I suggest just have a character with a little higher level. You're doing it for the experience and building the memories. You're not doing it to create a powerful character that you carry around with you forever. No one's keeping track of whether that one time back in 1982 you created a fighter illusionist that was 10-10. Okay? It's not that you had to earn it for four years straight. Now, in a lot of computer games, it's always about the curve and the journey of earning the character powers, half the gameplay. And you know, then people talk about what the end game is. But don't worry about that. If you want to have a session with your friend, you know, let the character class you're going to play, whether it's the per your friend's character he has from previous campaigns or the character you create from scratch, make them something that they want to play, that they're interested in playing. And that's also a good time to um, have a pre-generated character that they've never played before. And let's give you a couple examples here before we come back to the Tomb of Horrors. In the Hidden Shrine of Tomoe Shan, fantastic classic module. Um, it was used in a tournament years and years and years ago. If you look in the very, very back of the module, it's, it includes pre-generated characters. Um, you could do that. You could use the pre-generated characters. In uh, Tomb of Horrors, they created pre-generated characters in this one as well. But they're designed to work as a group. For example, I think the pre-generated characters in the Hidden Shrine of Tomoe Shan are it's like, I think it's like a fighter illusionist, a thief, and a, and a wizard, and things like that. You actually see their pictures of them um, in some of the artwork, and some of the pictures in the back, and things like that. These are some of the pre-generated characters. But you don't need to do that. Tailor the adventure, take the adventure, what's great about the adventure, and customize it to work with your friend's single character. So how do you actually do that? Well, one of the first things you want to do is read the module, see how it was designed, and read the specific locations. For example, let's just take Tomb of Horrors here. Um, if you read the first page of the Tomb of Horrors, you know, it's going to say right here, this is a thinking person's module. If your group is hack and slash, hack and slay gathering, they will be unhappy. You know, um, there, and that's right here. This module was written to be challenging for a group, a well-balanced, highly, high-level characters that were like this, you know, going through the dungeon, facing all these traps, ultimately fighting a Sirac, searching for the entrances. Um, these themes are throughout. This is the embodiment of the, of the first edition core theme and dream of playing in an adventure is figuring out what these mean, looking at these hallways. You can still do that with one character. How many times have you seen the, the infamous Indiana Jones film where Indiana, Indy's got some guy with him that betrays him, but he's going to the temple to reach, you know, retrieve the golden idol. You could take the same setting as this and make a goal where someone plays an assassin. A, work, a gnome illusionist could go through this whole thing. A little fighter could go through the whole thing. You, just, you need to balance out the difficulty. So it doesn't necessarily mean you need to remove all the enemies. And like, oh gosh, you know, in the Tomb of Horrors, they have this really, really powerful uh, gargoyle. This is stone gargoyle in there. It's like, a, you know, this is a fantastic image here. Well, you keep the gargoyle, just lower his armor class and lower his hit dice and just make him balance to whatever the balance is for your character. So when you get ready to balance something, you're going to want to look at things like that. So let's just, take a, let's just take a look at the board here real quick, right? Let's just say we were going to take 
think we're going to make it for our, our druid. And you know, I'll tell you what, let's make it even worse. Let's make it cleric. If we're going to make it for a cleric, right? So here's our cleric here. And uh, let's put him, let's put our camera right here closer to him so you can see what he looks like. So, say you want to make an adventure for your cleric buddy, right? He's like, I want to play my cool cleric. I got a cool build going on with him or whatever. I got some magic items with him and I want him to, I want to do the adventure for him. So I'm going to have him go into this ancient tomb and I want his goal is going to be maybe to, to recover some artifact or something, right? So you have to look at things like his armor class. What's his armor class? No matter what edition you look at, you got to figure out what his armor class is because the AC is going to determine how hard it's going to be to hit him. Then you need to create enough enemies or situations where you have one-on-one -on -one fights, like against a stone forearm, quadra-armed, whatever, stone gargoyle, where the player can hit the enemy and, and the enemy can hit you, but then make sure the damage that the enemy does isn't going to outpace the damage that the character can take versus how much they can heal themselves. So, if, you know, a cleric... He could cast Cure Light Wounds, drink a potion. He's going to be heavily armored. Kind of get familiar if you're playing 3rd edition, what his base attack bonus is. If you're playing 5th edition, what his, his proficiency bonuses are. If you're playing 1st edition, just look in the DM screen to figure out, like, what's it going to take for him to AC 0. And just uh, elevate up the armor class number. That's the first thing you can mess with. The second thing you can mess with is the uh, damage output of the enemy. So you can say DPS if you're playing an MMO. The damage output of the enemy, you want it to be challenging, but you don't want to get one-shotted, right? So you want it to be a situation where, like, wow, I barely killed that guy. And uh, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. So you kind of want to think about, well, you know, am I afraid I'm going to get killed? So if the person playing the character, like playing our cleric character here, Antola, uh, is he afraid of being killed? Well, I don't know. Let's take a look at Antola. You know, we've got him in our... Uh, Here's Antoli. He's a level 12 cleric. Heavily armored, negative 4 armor class, 96 health because he's a max health character from a max health campaign. So if Antola was in here fighting a bunch of these orcs, which are low-level scrubs, it would not be challenging. But there's nothing wrong with me boosting them up and making them you know, orc heroes or something. Or I, if I wanted to, I could put mind players in there, or I could elevate it to be a bunch of NPCs. You know, I could have him facing off against a villain. I could create a villain character for him to fight against that some, you know, rogue warrior that's trying to kill him um so your goal is to make sure when you do get into those moment-to-moment -moment combat scenarios that it's balanced and that can be either um you know one heroic character or you're mowing through mobs and groups you have a situation where you're surrounded on four you know three or four sides and you're having to deal with all this damage output coming from these enemies and he's got to think tactically about what to do then you have to imagine what it's like to play that class. So what can he do tactically? You know, if you're playing, uh, if you're playing Varenjar, you have the ability to hide in shadows and kill some of these guys from behind. So you kind of want the person to have that Splinter Cell, Stealther, Rogue Stealther kind of vibe, and go into the situation hidden in shadows, figure out what to do, then come around and kill a couple of them quickly, and then kind of get out, get in and get out. Where if you're playing the cleric, he could probably just run in the front door and start wailing on people and casting some of his offensive spells. So. All this stuff seems relatively obvious, but you can take any module, any adventure, and, you know, tone it down so it works for that character. And then you can do things like some of the moments like this, okay? This is something from the Tomb of Horrors where you've got the statue, one arm is missing, and where the, some of the puzzles can happen. And one of the things about D&D that's uh, really, really great is that it's not just about the combat. It's not just a, it's not a war game. Uh, just a war game. It's a uh, there's adventure, there's treasures, there's tricks, there's traps, there's all kinds of cool, cool hidden locations and things to do. And then there's adversaries and all this kind of business. You want to kind of balance the gameplay between up and down and up and down and kind of give it a rhythm. You know, explore a little bit, find some cool clue, find a letter. You know, find some crazy vial that you can't identify. Do you drink it? Do you not drink it? What do you do with it? You know, let the player as you play with the player. Um, you'll get an idea of what they're really intrigued by. You see their eyes light up, like, oh, I'm trying to figure out this puzzle, you know. Let's just take an example. Um, you may have a player who thinks that um, this is the greatest thing ever, right? Let's just take this, get untold out of the way. They, you, they think that this massive, long riddle, you know, from uh, White Plume Mountain, this old White Plume Mountain from 3.5, they rewrote it, and they think this is amazing. They're going to sit here and just analyze every single word of this Karaptus's, whatever the name his name is, his little, uh, you know, poem that he has. It's like deciphering that to figure out what to do and then going through the adventure and trying to figure out how does that apply to some of these locations and things like that. So some players may really like that kind of stuff. Some players may really just want to kick in the, you know, one the hidden shrine of Timoashan is a good one because it has a theme where you are exploring this, uh, you know, kind of Mayan temple. It kind of looks like this. Let's just pan from left to right for you. And they give you kind of a side view up here. 
and you know who can who doesn't know what Mayan temples and Aztec temples look like from looking at National Geographic or pictures on the internet. Maybe it's fun to try to figure out where the secret passages are, or decipher all the the languages on the wall. And if you're playing a cleric or you're playing an illusionist, that might be something that's fun to do. And then you're going to get combat situations. You want to deal with that as well. So those are the kinds of things you can think about doing. What's the moment to moment fun factor for the player? Don't give them just that. Ramp them up and down and kind of take them out of their comfort zone. So but as a DM, don't try to wing it. And don't lie, okay? But think about it ahead of time and come up with what you think is going to be a pretty neat situation for them and then just see how they handle it. And then the next time you have another play session, you're like, well, you know, my player, he, he gets frustrated when he can't figure out. He knows there's a secret door in a room and he can't open it. Well, give him a chance to open it. Just make it where it's easy to detect. Make the secret door slightly ajar. Somebody just went through it. Have footprints on the floor that lead to where um, the secret door is. If your player is super observant and ask a lot of questions, like, well, what do I see in the room? You know. So if you look at, uh, let's look at the Shana, Tomoe Shana again, right? It's another one of these modules that has a lot of great visual aids. And I would recommend that if you are going to take, you know, if you're going to take one of these older modules, I mean, who doesn't want to figure that out? I mean, that's right out of Indiana Jones. This is some brilliant work done in 1979 and 1980 by Jeff D, who I believe lives in Austin. Um, he's in some of the Facebook groups too. So I mean, some of these old pictures were, were brilliantly done. And show this picture to the player, and you can read the description in the module. And that can be any level. You can be a level one character and experience the same thing. So you don't need someone to create a custom module just for you for a level five thief to have a good time. All you gotta do is just balance out the combat so no one gets killed and one-shotted. Um, you can balance out the treasure. Now we can take it a few uh, factors higher than that too, right? So now you got the basic idea behind that. We're gonna scale combat. Let's check our little notes here. What else do we got? So balancing it, yeah, you want to do that. And there's a you can do, you know, enemy enemy quantity up, lower hit points, easy to hit, or you can make less enemies and make them more epic fights intermittently, and then allow the player to try to explore and figure out the dungeon, and then balance that with some traps and give them some puzzles. And so you kind of have the gun the gameplay is kind of undulating like a sine curve, right? And then you'll figure out pretty quickly what they're into. If you just ramrod combat, combat, combat down their throat or puzzles, 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 sometimes someone's not in the mood for all that. They want to see a little bit of everything, mix their mind, shift gears, and use the different parts of their brain to figure things out. So that's what gameplay is all about. When you see a computer game, if you play the first Assassin's Creed, it's just, me just meleeing down enemies over and over and over. Or if you play Diablo 1 and Diablo 2, it's like chug potion, bang, 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 chug potion, bang. It gets old. So people in Diablo 3, you're tweaking the builds. Maybe you're working on getting death breaths. You're re-rolling another character. You're doing the season. They try to create some more different things to do. And in Dungeons and Dragons, the excitement is, what could I actually do with this cool character? What could I have done differently? What spell should I have taken differently? Have I gotten a new magic item? What do I do with this situation that's happening on, at, on hand in, my, uh, in the battle in front of me? Um, what do I do about this one NPC that's getting in my face trying to kill me? He's really hard. Should I try running away? What, should I use an illusion? What should I do? So um, those are the kinds of things you can do. The spirit is really to create something that's going to work for your player and entertain them, but don't try to force them to do it the way you think you want them to do it. So you kind of want to create, you've heard the word sandbox, games like Far Cry and the Crisis games and Skyrim and Oblivion and Morrowind. Those are scant size, uh, sandbox games. They create a rule, a, a world with a rule set. The Elder Scrolls Online is a great sandbox game. Um, world of Warcraft, not much, not so much. Um, where you can go in there and get lost in a world and do whatever you want to do and set your own goals. And sure, there's quests, but you don't have to do them. So think about your campaign that you want to do or the dungeon adventure make it you know a single location like this for one play session like in this crazy silly map that we did here with this coastal water cliff and this crazy little Mayan temple and ruins and stairs going up I mean all this you could go here in the middle of the night it could be in the middle of a rainstorm like think about the setting think about the time of day think about what's happening um, you know try to make the place come alive a little bit more so it's uh doesn't feel like um it, it just doesn't feel like the same old, same old. Oh, you arrive, it's midday, it's blue sky, and the sun and the seagulls are in the background, and uh, there you go, there you have it. So that's something else that can be a lot of fun. You'll increase your game design skills as you try to create unique blends and situations of elements such as that. Same thing for being a level designer. No one wants to create a box room with a door and another box room and a door. That would essentially be the same gameplay forever. So... Um, Besides keeping the uh, the gameplay oriented around what your friend wants to play as a character, if they have a pre-existing character, 
or they want to try a new class out. And by obviously making sure the combat's balanced, um, there's some other thing, and in keeping the, the up and down underlying uh, gameplay, you kind of want to also tap into what a motivation could be. I mean, we watch a film, you read a book, there's a plot line, right? There's a storyline. So try to find things that'll be a motivator for your player, the person, not the actual character. You can try to find something that's a motivator or a goal for the person that also kind of comes alive through the character. That sounds kind of complicated and lofty, but let's talk about that in a little bit more detail. So you're going to need to create challenges in the way of the goal. So what is the goal? Well, okay, say they have this, you know, cool map of the world of Greyhawk, and you have given them a letter from their father, right? and it says you need to come back to the kingdom right away. Something terrible is happening with your mother. I mean, that's the storyline. Bam, go. And you could be at the other end of the universe. you got to travel all the way from here, and it's just an excuse to travel. Like, the point of the journey is not to arrive. The goal is this overarching thing of throwing the ring in the Mount Doom, but you're going to get in all kinds of trouble and get kidnapped by pirates on the way and end up in, a long, in the wrong place. That's just a, an inciting incident to kick off a massive campaign. Maybe your player is like, oh man, I really love playing uh, World of Warcraft and the Burning Crusade expansion and, um, oh, what was it, Naxx not Naxxramas, I can't remember what it was. The one dungeon that had Morose in it, I can't remember what it was called. Maybe you want to do something that's just like the Ghost Tower of Inverness um, that has that cool kind of undead uh, dinner table you rang with the butler going on with it. Or maybe you want something that has that Rom Romulo and Juliet setting. I forgot the name of that dungeon. Karazhan, was it Karazhan? I think it's Karazhan. Maybe you want that vibe, but give them a goal. Well, what's the what's the goal? Is there some kind of magic item you're trying to retrieve? Are you do you want them to just you know they've just they've been charged to go do something by someone else? Is there a personal character goal oriented around it? When you're reading a novel, um, a lot of times it's not readily apparent on the first page what the goal is. Like, oh, here's an example. Okay, so here's a book done by Elaine Cunningham, uh, Evermeet, which is one of the only books ever covering the island of Evermeet in the Forgotten Realms, right? It's a thick beast of a book, and it talks about Lolf and all the elves and how things happen, and all these Amulur and these characters and these houses of elves. It's a neat book. It's a thicky, though. It's kind of like a Stephen King thick one. It's like 490 pages of old paperback from the 80s, right? Um, there isn't really an underlying goal connecting the whole thing together, but there's a bunch of family that connects everything together, so there's a lot of family storyline elements in that. So that kind of stuff makes it kind of hard to work with. But if you pick up something like this, right, this stuff is Pulp Fiction kind of junk from the 30s, the Robert E. Howard stuff, or right, Elsprog to Comp and Lid, Lid, uh, Lynn Carter. And a lot of these old Conan stories, they're like 20-page chapters. And they're usually a situation where, you know, goodness, I got this for 70, this is from 75P when I was over in Europe. The, the Curse of the Monolith, right? Grab an old crappy book from a used bookstore like this, and read it, or comic book, or graphic novel, or whatever you like, and read through it, and s start to think about how the story is unfolding, how is it being told to you. I mean, look at these old yellow pages, they're crazy. In this situation, guess who the hero is? It's always Conan, right? Just one guy. Now, sometimes he has other characters with him, um, but not all, not all the time. They don't persist through long periods of time, whether it's Red Sonja, or Belit, or whoever. So when you're thinking about creating a dungeon for your one friend, your buddy, you know, draw influence from some of these old classic fantasy novels and read through the situations that happen in there and think to yourself, hey, you know, that's kind of cool because, and then, you know, you, the, you can find there's lots of different books that all have these kind of themes. When the Savage Sword of Conan comic books came out in graphic novels by Buscema was the artist on it in, this, in the late 70s and 80s, they were like one-shot deal. You know, it's 80 pages of, of graphic novel before there was color-printed gloss cardstock. It was all st saddle stitch stuff. And it'd be one story. And only did they do the sort of skelos and stuff over time did it stretch out. You know, this is one of my favorites here, uh, Conan the Buccaneer. It's a great one. There's a map, and these bad guys have this map, and they're going to try to get this old book for Thulsa Doom and Thoth Amon or whatever. And Conan's trying to rescue some girl, and he's in the ship with a bunch of buddies, and they go to this island. All this kind of stuff, mayhem happens, b bump into some demon, try to rescue the girl, a bunch of people get killed. And then they face off with these bad guys. It's a really cool story. And it's really uh, straightforward, but it's basically just an island, and you know, you're in a boat, and they go to an island, and a bunch of stuff goes down. So keep it simple like that. Um, the Elric books are great. Michael Moorcock, they're a little bit more dark and, and uh, moody, because, you know, if you know the Elric stuff by Michael Moorcock, who's a British author, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it's Stormbringer is this magical black sword that uh, gives him power. Without the sword, he's just a weak, pathetic albino, and the character's kind of strange. It's kind of like the, 
in some ways, it's kind of like Dritz to Erden. His major character flaw is he's a uh, you know an albino, not very strong. Needs Stormbringer to keep him strong, whereas Dritz to Erden's living in a world where there's racial prejudice or whatever. But the Michael Moorcock stories are really, really good too because you can find books with some of these in there and just pick up one of the chapters and read a 25-page chapter and go, you know what, I really like that one. Uh, like the Sailor on the Seas of Fate. They go to this island. He just wakes up one day on this island. There's this quest going on. This boat picks him up in this mist, and he meets like six other NPCs he's never met before, and they all go ashore to kill some old ones, and they have this massive battle in this huge creepy tunnel, and a bunch of people get killed, and then they escape. And there was no real... There's no real major plot line to it. And then he get, he drops off the, the boat and goes somewhere else. It's just like an interlude. So pick up on fiction. Like even when I was writing this novel here, I had to create, using a historical event, which is the Battle of Marignano, is the climax of this whole novel. And everything in the whole novel is all leading up multiple characters to that moment. It's like imagine the climax being D-Day. If say you're writing a World War II book, it's like Saving Private Ryan, right? It's all... The, st the story about the characters is all woven in and out with the actual event of the invasion of D-Day. So you get to relive that, but the real story is about saving Private Ryan. So having something historical, historical context is good to do too. So that's another great way to get, draw inspiration is grab some fiction and uh, read it and think about and extrapolate out of the fiction what the core kind of uh, storyline element is. Let's just uh, boost this up here a little bit. Give me just half a second. Make sure I got the uh, white balance wacky, so it makes it look like I'm dying of some disease. <laughs> um, I'm not a good cameraman. We're learning over time, learning over time. So let's go with some other details here. Let me turn this uh, white balance down a little bit. Okay, so that's storyline elements. You got motivations, um, challenges in a way. You want to provoke the player to improvise and do things in a different way they would normally. The modules already do that. So if you dig up one of these older modules, watch a visual reference in it, and you present them with these chambers here, you're like, what do you do? This is what you see. This is what the challenge is. You know, I strongly encourage you to dig up some of these old ones here. Now, another thing you can do, which I think is really good, is take a module but completely change the population, okay? Instead of saying, um, hey, you know, we're going to play the Tomb of Horrors and the C-Rack is, is the big villain again, Go through something like this. You know, go through the uh, Fiend Folio is an obscure dungeon uh, monster manual type book. And it's got a lot of really, really, really nasty baddies in here like this crypt thing. And just change the hit dice numbers and AC numbers to what you want it to be. Um, there's some fantastic, even these little dark creepers. These, these are brilliantly done. I mean, the picture there on the right of the, you know, D'Artagnan type guy with the lantern in his hand with a sword in the other hand is rapier and these little dark creepers in the background. You could take the Tomb of Horrors and just fill it with deep gnomes if you wanted to. So there's nothing wrong with changing the theming. Just try to keep it somehow connected. Now imagine all these dark creeper guys are in the Tomb of Horrors, right? They might have some kind of uh, you know, Egyptian theme. Now why would I say that? If you look at the Tomb of Horrors itself, you look at the artwork on it, it uses a lot of uh, painted frescoes and uh, there's designs on the walls and things like that. And it's really kind of an undead lich, but even this first signature shot right here with the trick trapped uh, box. I mean, that's just looks like Anubis almost. Even though it's got this demonic imagery and you think of the Tomb of Annihilation and all that kind of stuff. So is what could you think of that would you know fit this magical, crazy, multicolored portals and all this kind of stuff they have in this module? What would, What's going to fit with this infamous picture here? You know, this painting, which is the picture here, is turned on its side or some of these traps even thinking about, you know, this kind of stuff here, something right out of Greek mythology. You know, this baddie here is in the dungeon. is real nasty. It's an animated skeleton, really bast real bastard to fight. There's an ancient church. There's all kinds of traps where the floor slides down into a fire pit. Lots of traps. You have, a, you know, mummies and illusions, all kinds of things going on. I mean, you may find that the original modules already have the right theming for the enemies. You just need to adjust the numbers. But if you want to take somewhere that maybe the player has been to before and completely change it, don't be afraid to draw inspiration from some of the monster books. You know, you may want to make a whole story that's just about this one death night, and you have to go through this entire undead town where everyone's died and no one's there anymore but a bunch of ghosts, not zombies. Don't do zombies. They've just been done to death. <laughs> and you're trying to find this one death night, like a Wrath of the Lich King kind of a vibe, right? Another thing you could do is, like, you know, don't be afraid to uh, go dig up, you know, another game system. You know, and, and look through another game system and say, okay, 
which character do I think is really awesome in here? Who is someone really cool, really interesting? So here's this Nyalo Stormstrike on page, what page is this? 113 of this Pathfinder NPC Codex. And it talks about her, gives you a description of what she's all about, her combat encounter. This is all 3.5 edition type stuff. You know, you might find that to be really, really interesting. Or this character here, or this, uh, you know, Hammer of Justice type uh, Dwarven fighter, or this dual wielding guy here, this Forge Rider. You might find this uh, Jatha Ventoth. I mean, the people have picked time and energy to design these NPC characters for you. You may want to have a situation where your friend wants to try playing a class, go pull up an NPC from another game system and transport, like this bounty hunter here, and transport that. Say, hey, which, take a look at this book, dude. Check it out. Pick someone in there you want. I'll make a character sheet for you. And, you know, this cool assassin here, this chain mauler guy, really a brilliant piece of artwork because the pictures done by these books are totally inspirational. And then you may want to do something like, okay, well, what's the goal going to be? Well, you might want to flip through this, right? This is the thing about the Pathfinder books I think are so fantastic is they're very specific. You just You could just read through here and pick almost anything, anything, almost anything anywhere, and say, you know what? We want to, uh, you, may want, you want to make it a goal for someone to discover something. They even talk about where the pieces of gear would be, you know, this kind of business. Um, the strand of prayer beads or the stone of conjuring earth elementals. You could tie in a storyline that takes the magic item, makes it a focus point. The dust of emulation could be an item you want to have. You know, you can have magic items that you sprinkle through the campaign and maybe tone down their power level. Um, that's another thing you can think about, right? So besides drawing references from fiction and using existing modules, you also, I also strongly encourage you to grab some of the other Bullman's books that he's written in Pathfinder and read some of the Game Master guides because these Game Master guides have all kinds of wonderful, almost like essays that talk about, you know, what's your duty as a GM? What are you supposed to be doing? When to, where to play, how to play, how do you build the world ahead of time? Take some time and read this stuff. You know, just go into Facebook and say, can anyone recommend a module for one, for two players? Just take one of the existing ones you can get your hands on and change it. A couple more little details I want to go over, and then we'll wrap this episode up. Um, is uh, Also, this is one thing, I don't know if you noticed this, but uh, the thing that Paizo has done in the last few years, which is brilliant, is when the Pathfinder stuff first came out, you have these big hardbacks, right? And they're relatively, they're pretty expensive. This is a, this is a $40, um, $40 book. You can get the PDF for less from Paizo directly. But they also made these much more affordable $19, smaller, just just as glossy, beautiful pocket size. But you can stick them in your backpack if you're a student or something. Um, villains. Wow, this one's fantastic. So you need villains. you got to have villains. It can't just always be creepy monsters all the time. If you need a villain, just come in here somewhere and dig up some of these villains. They have all categorized, whether they're ruthless brigands or they're holy knights or... This archer here, every single one of these ones, I went through every single one of these. Some of the villains that are done this in this book are absolutely brilliant. I'm just going to move this up here a little bit and reduce the size on it some. So you can see as we're holding books up here, having to look in too much detail. There you go. So, you know, you've got characters, characters like this. They're just fantastic. Even just the picture is an inspiration. And you'll find that these kind of NPC guides are going to tell you all about them, what their motivations are and what they're doing and why they're doing these things. So be sure to put a villain in there. You know, you can have a one-shot encounter kind of like this board right here. Let's just say you're going to have a one-shot encounter. You're going to have bugbears, right? One, two, three, four, four or five bugbears there, two guys guarding. And let's just make the story up here right now on the spot, right? We are going to play. Who are we going to play? In fact, let's just say we're going to play the druid. So we're going to make an adventure for a friend. They want to play the druid, level 10 druid. Let's get Phil Churn up. So you know what? Phil Churn is pretty overpowered, but that's fine. So you, if Phil Churn is coming to this jungle island to uh, recover. Um, well, I know what. i tell you what. Let's pull something off another game system. We're going to take a quick interlude here. It's not a lot of D&D &D players play Traveler, right? I love Traveler. You can't get these books anymore, but you can get some of the smaller ones. They had a book Mark Miller wrote with his team at Game Designers Workshop called 76 Patrons. Let's just go right there to this page. I got it marked already. And then 76 Patrons would provide you with seeds for storylines. So there's one right here, page 15 of 76 Patrons. It looks like this. Look it up. If you can remember it, maybe get a copy of it. It's from a friend or something. 
76 pages. Now, it's based on Traveler, which is a science fiction setting, but the actual ideas and the writing behind them are really good. Here's one right here, right? So, at the bar, one of the less expensive hotels in Plum, you know, City Starport, a bartender presses a note asking the group to come and meet someone at the rear of the bar. The occupant de de uh, identifies himself as blah, 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 professor in one of the local universities. He spent most of his life in the study of a history and says he's got a written history of this one area. Um, his office was recently broken into a number of manuscripts for his new book has been stolen. It's worth thousands and thousands. Um, a local noble suspects that some amateur historian has, has stolen it and taken the item. Um, he's also concerned that some of the detailed information that was uh, connected to historical research could be used to activate some kind of evil power or things like that. So you could take these kind of basic ideas and go, hmm, that's kind of interesting. Okay, so it's kind of like the Indiana Jones Crystal Skull series. I think it was the one that had Sean Connery in it. So you, the druid could be approached by maybe another druid or a wizard to, I need you to go to this ruins and bring back some artifact that we know is here, and maybe these bugbears are here doing the same thing adjust the hit dice numbers up and down and uh, have her come to arrive here by boat at night and she's by herself and she's got to deal with these little encounters with these bugbears one by one she can use her air effect and tangle spells and work her way up all the way up to here and maybe when she gets up to the top she can commune with animals and you may have animal characters that she can interact with and discover that the artifact's been moved and it's hidden somewhere else and maybe some tribal people have moved it to a new location now she's got to go to a tribal village and talk to the people and the elders of the village maybe they're not hostile and she has to use some parlaying and talking and her charisma rolls to find out what happened to it. And they say it's a sacred item, but it was stolen by some villain, right? And the villain is some, you know, trumped up pirate guy. And he's on a boat and it's the other side of the island docked there. She has to go all the way across the island in the middle of the night and see where this pirate ship is and figure out how to infiltrate the pirate ship in the middle of the night and sneak on board and either steal the artifact back or kill her in their sleep. And so by in less than two or three hours, you know, you've got her on the deck of a boat in the middle of the night, you know, fighting a bunch of uh, badass pirates and villains. She kills them all, and then she can take their ship and burn it to the ground or whatever she wants to do and go back to the island and get on her little boat and sail back to victory and get a, get a reward. There you go. There's a story really fast for you. So that's the kind of stuff you want to do. But it takes a lot of work to lay all that stuff out ahead of time. So, you know, lift a map from something else. Lift the first temple map from the hidden shrine of Tomoashan. Say, well, you know, I don't have time to draw a bunch of crazy cool architectural maps. So, okay, why don't we just do this then? Why don't you just take this map right here Take this existing map right here in the upper right hand corner. In fact, it's inside the module. In fact, I'll turn right to the page for you. There you go. There's the top area. That's a different, it's a ruin, it's the top of a ziggurat, kind of like this is, right? So there you go. That's where you go to. In fact, if you want to, just put the artifact right there on the top and just have a bunch of cronies guarding it and she can wipe them all out and go re and recover the artifact and, and get out of Dodge. You know, I think the things that makes it interesting is when there's twist you know, if you're watching a movie the hero the movie would end in the first fight scene if it's not some kind of a plot twist so try to think about those things like think to yourself like when we do the adventure they think they're just going to come up here and have this happen but when they get up here they discover a clue that leads them somewhere else and now they're having to improvise now they're kind of wrapped into the story and they're going to go to the next area and something weird is going to happen there and they're not just always fighting and killing things and before you know it there's a villain involved you had no idea even from the very beginning when you're first given the briefing to do a Suddenly there's B, then there's C, and then there's character D, and now you have a big nasty battle, and then you find out there's plot twists, that person's related to the other person, and boom, you got a really complex story. So those are the kinds of details that can kind of hook your player on why they're doing all these actions, and they'll start thinking like the character, maybe not role-playing like the character, but thinking like the character, trying to make decisions as the character, and they're slipping in their power gaming, and their treasure collecting, and their killing, and their tactical combat, and maybe a little storyline, and you'll be able to modify it and slide it back and forth a little bit, you know to make it fit them and it doesn't have to be something that takes a lot of time and energy you just need to kind of have a little basic infrastructure for storytelling and if you're like oh dude i'm not good at storytelling at all then just go grab a grab a cheap book grab a cheap book for 75p <laughs> and read a short story that's 12 pages long and say you know what i'm just going to take that short story verbatim i'm going to use this map from this dungeon i'm going to use this npc from this michael moorcock book I'm going to use, you know, this villain from this Pathfinder book. I'm going to use this battle map that I got at a role-playing game store. And I'm going to use these crappy miniatures that Classic DM taught me how to make. I'm going to make this epic battle that's going to happen on this boat. And it'll be awesome. So there you go. And then your friend will be like, oh, dude, that was the most fun. That was the coolest adventure I ever played in my life. You should sell modules. <laughs> that's like, and then, you know, the next time you, you have, oh, my friend wants to come play. Well, well what do you got to do now? Now you got something that's you can have things ramp up and ramp down based upon how many people want to play. 
So once you've got someone hooked and you've learned how to manipulate and design and create something for one person to really get them enamored, and then you add another person to the dynamic, you're going to have to learn about what they want too because now you have two players to deal with and you're the DM. In summary, you want to provoke those players to um, make response, to make decisions that are fun for them to decide, that are hard decisions for them. You want them to play the characters the way they want to play them. You don't want them to connect dots in your story. You want the story to unfold before them. That seems based on their player actions. And you may need to fudge storyline elements if they're not getting it. Like if they keep going to this area and, and they don't have any idea how to transcribed a bunch of ruins and carvings on the side of the temple you may want to put some obvious picture on the side of it that shows you know a massive set of ships that look like the spanish invaded and it shows a ship and a bunch of natives holding up the idol we did that in our g2 campaign you may have picked up on that right in our gla in our glacial rift of frost giant jarl and we did the steading of the hill giant chief we did this we did this silly sketch and we actually had the party decipher what these symbols meant and we had to actually come up with the idea that listen no one's going to get it unless they can see the pictures of drow sacrificing um this child to lolf and we actually had to put this big line here underline that says don't kill the child they give them hope that the child hasn't already been killed so those are the kinds of details you can modify to make things kind of click together um when things kind of go awry so you can always give the players more hints and kind of get them back on course but don't force them to go on course let them let it crystallize in, a, in their own mind what to do so in summary um Designing stuff for other people to play is about the players. It's about them. Uh, you want it to be exciting. You want it to be fun. You want to tap into what they want to do. Um, you don't want to control everything. You're just along for the cool ride watching the story unfold. Um, when you play a session and you walk away from the session, think about what went good and what went bad. Think about what you need to modify. Think, oh, you know, I was going to have them fight this. I had this big fort that was like a Spanish fort. I wanted them to invade that and do a frontal assault, but that's a lot of NPCs, big battle. These guys, are just they're just slaying things in the middle of the night and doing a lot of stealth attacks. Maybe what you want to do is have them sneak into the fort in the middle of the night and have half the guards asleep and just have them kill someone. So, And at the end of the day, remember one word, fun. So everything you do for someone else, whether you're designing a building, you're designing a game, or writing a novel, or, or running a D&D campaign as a DM, is about fun. And the more players you have, the harder it's going to be to balancing the fun for everyone. It's like trying to entertain six friends. Um, but if you have one person or just two people, you can do a lot of cool things with it to make it fun for them. Because the more fun you make it for them, the more they're going to come back and you're going to get to play more. And then one day they're going to run stuff for you and you'll be able to sh share your resources. And someone else can buy this book and someone else can have these minis and whatever you want to do. And they might introduce you to a cool new game and your hobby is just going to grow and grow and grow and have a lot more fun. So that's it in summary. So I hope that kind of answers the question from a broad perspective. I may uh, elaborate on this in greater detail at a later date. may design something one day and just share it. But those are the kinds of things you need to do. Any content you have, you can convert it. You can draw inspiration from all kinds of sources, locations. Um, just go for it. You don't need someone to hand you a module that's specifically designed for one player. you got everything at your disposal out there at every RPG shop and every online store. you just got to modify it a little bit. And changing a few numbers to make the monsters and the enemies killable and work i mean you can play a computer game and say wow this is out of balance if you can do that then you can know how to balance it for yourself in a DD &D game all right we're going to leave it at that i hope you had fun and uh, leave a comment like and subscribe if you want and share this with your friends if you like these kind of episodes if you have something that you want to know about that you'd like to hear kind of a, a rant on or a conversation or a lecture on or whatever you want to call it um let me know and i'll be happy to accommodate that kind of stuff too and uh, hope you enjoyed it and we'll talk to you again real soon